All right, it's my honor to sit down for a few minutes with LSU baseball coach Paul Maneri. Uh, coach, you're the first guest on, on Tigers win, and I thought that was fitting uh, for a number of reasons. One, because you're the winningest active coach in, in college baseball, and I was, I was looking at the numbers. It's 1,467 wins, and you know, I, Bill Frankes does a great job writing up all the bios and everything on LSUsports.net, and I was reading that tidbit, and I thought, well, you must be the winningest coach in all of college sports, right? Because baseball, you're playing so many games. and <laughs> Probably. Well, thanks for not bringing up how many losses. No, there that's, were, Cody. this is Tigers win, that. not Tigers lose. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, thank you, first of all, for having me on the first edition of this. I'm very proud of that. And, you know, I, I don't really get caught up in career wins and those kinds of things. It's funny, when I was a young coach, I did. Mm-hmm. You know, I, my father was a coach, and I remember when he would, would have a milestone victory, you know, his 300th career win or his 500th career win, and certainly his 1,000th career win. He was the very first junior college coach to win 1,000 games in his career. So that was a significant accomplishment. And of course, I was a young coach at the time, and I thought, oh, that'd be so cool to have a milestone win, you know. Mm-hmm. And I remember the 100th win of my career, you know, against the United States Naval Academy when I was coaching at St. Thomas, and they gave me a plaque, and I was so proud of it, you know. And then as you go through and you get older, and you, you're not really concerned with milestone wins, you're concerned with winning championships, you're concerned with, the development of young people under your that have been entrusted to you by their parents uh, you want to help them develop into men you want to you know you you realize why you went into coaching mm-hmm. and it's for the reasons that I just mentioned you know to impact young people's lives so the milestone wins didn't mean as much to me as we went down the line until we until we won my 1000 one, my 1000 and 12th win because that tied my father for yeah. his career. Yeah. And so that was, that was pretty significant for me. You know, I get a little emotional when I think sure. about it. But, um, but now, you know, I, hey, listen, I just want to see LSU win as many games as we can. It's not pulmonary winning the games, of course. Um, and I think one thing that it does demonstrate, though, is that we've, we've had a long career. We've had wonderful kids for many, many years. I'm now beginning my 39th year as a college baseball coach, my 15th at LSU. And I've enjoyed it, and I've just been the luckiest guy in the world to be able to do something that I love doing, which is being around baseball, coaching baseball, and being around young people and representing wonderful institution. And, you know, it's a lot more fun to win than lose. So let's mm-hmm. see if we can't win a few more before <laughs> we call it quits. No doubt. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the goals of this podcast, I, I grew up with coaches. Both of my parents were coaches. My brother's a coach. And being at LSU, I'm with coaches all the time. And I, I consider coaches almost experts in success or at least the, the things that you try to build around you to, to generate success, right? Like a lot of us in our daily life, you know, I go into my office and – you know, I got one picture on the wall here and a picture over there. And, you know, I kind of sit down on my computer and start working. I'm not really thinking about motivational techniques. I'm not really thinking about practical steps that, that I can take necessarily every day consciously. But every time I'm – is that your phone? I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I, I am so sorry. Can you- I thought it was Matt for a second. I thought Matt was narrating the – I mean, scoring the uh, the interview. You were talking about in your office yeah, yeah. that you have pictures, but sure. you don't think about motivational sure. stuff. Sure, and, and, I, and I try to incorporate some of that in my daily life, but I realized I'm surrounded at LSU by people who think about that stuff all the time. And so I want to selfishly pick their brains and learn what I can, but also share that with our fans. And so one of the things that we talked about when we came in here was was your actual physical space of your office and all the pictures that you have everywhere. And we had a good conversation about it, and I guess I could just ask you to repeat what you said because it was so profound, but... I do find it interesting the spaces that we work in and how we you know, try to surround ourselves. And there's, there's a great quote, I'm going to botch it, but I'll paraphrase that, you know, your, your external space reflects your internal space. So if you're organized externally, you'll be organized internally, which I'm not the most organized person externally, mm-hmm. so I've, but I've tried to incorporate that, right? And so I come into your office and there's just pictures everywhere. And that seems very intentional, right? That you've surrounded yourself with in this way. Cody, I, I, I don't make any apologies for wanting to be successful. You know, I, I'd never cheated. I nev- don't uh, take the shortcuts for success. In fact, every year I tell our team, we're not going to look for shortcuts. We're going to purposely search out the hard way to do hmm. it so that when we get to hold that big trophy up above our head, we're going to know we did it the right way, hmm. and it's going to mean an awful lot more to us. So... Um, I think it's the American way. 
I think I think you're supposed to try to succeed. I think that's what my job is here, not just to win games and win championships to keep the the LSU fans and and everybody else happy, but to teach our our young men that are in our program what it takes to be successful. Mm -hmm. Because today, hey, it's going to be on the friendly fields of strife, you know, representing LSU. But later in life, it's going to be more important, you know, how to make that sale, how to be successful while you're performing surgery, how to maintain a wonderful relationship with a spouse or to guide your children through tough times when they're having them. And, and all of the things that they learn through college athletics are the things that they're going to apply later on in life to be able to have a happy, successful life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, uh, earlier this week I had a phone call with a former player of mine who's going through a real challenging thing in his life right now. You know, he's, he's, he's very ill, and, and um, it's, it's a life-threatening situation. And he reached out to me because he needed to talk to me. He needed me to motivate him and inspire mm-hmm. him to, to keep fighting and that, you know, he was feeling sorry for himself and that, that's not what I taught him to do. And he kind of needed me to kind of chew him out a little bit and kind of get him back online and keep fighting this thing that, you know, for me, that's, that's what I do. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm supposed to do that, you know, the, the fact that this young man reached out to me at a time when he desperately needed some motivation and to be inspired to keep fighting the good fight makes me feel like I'm validated as a coach because that's why I went into coaching. You know, my father was a coach, as I mentioned earlier in the interview. And when I told him I wanted to be a coach, that's basically what he told me. Don't go into coaching unless you're doing it for the right reasons. And the right reasons are to impact young people, to teach them what it takes to be successful. Don't do it because of the prestige. Don't do it because of winning. Don't do it because of maybe you make some money someday. You have to do it for the young men that you're going to be coaching. And whether I coached at St. Thomas or the Air Force Academy or Notre Dame or at a, here finally at LSU, maybe the pressure to win has been ratcheted up mm-hmm. with the, with each step along the way. But my vision of what my role is in these young people's lives has never changed. So you mentioned about all these pictures yeah. on the wall behind me. You know, basically that's my life up there. Mm-hmm. And and I call it my humble wall because these pictures all, they're not, some people are famous. You know, there's some famous people up there, but not most of them. Most of them are people that that have been an impact in my personal life that have either supported me, given me an opportunity, been with me at a key moment in life, have been very instrumental in the success that we have had. So whenever I start thinking, hey, I'm pretty good at what I do, I always look up at that wall and realize that you never did anything alone. Mm -hmm. There had to be other people that were there to support you, help you do the work, and so forth. And um, so I I look at that wall quite frequently because it, it just reminds me of how fortunate, how lucky I've been in my lifetime to do what I love doing and that we've had enough success that I've been able to do it for a long time. We talked before and you said you could literally go through every single picture and tell the story. Um, We don't have time for that, but is there one, is there one that you've looked at maybe recently in the last couple of days and that you hadn't looked at in a while? Cause I'm the, I'm looking at the frame behind you. It almost looks like an Instagram grid Mm -hmm. for, for our uh, millennial listeners. It's, you know, I mean, it's, it's dozens and dozens of pictures. Is there one that stands out? Maybe from recent days that you you just looked at. Do you want at. me to stand up and show it to you, or do <laughs> you want me to just tell you about it? Uh, you can, you can I, point I out it if you want I, to. I looked at it the other day because if the camera follows me over here. <laughs> yeah, see how the, talented the, our the microphone's got some is. reach. But um, this this picture, um, where where did I have it? Okay, uh, it's a the third row from the top. There's a picture. There's three pictures there, but the the main picture is my myself, my dad, and Tommy Lasorda. Mm-hmm. And that was literally the day, the moment that I met Tommy Lasorda. And so when he recently passed away, you know, I had kind of a private moment for myself where I came back to my office. I think I had counted 16 pictures I have of him on Mm -hmm. my wall somewhere. But, But that day kind of brought back memories. I was 25 years old and I had met him after a golf tournament that my dad was hosting and he came down to, this was after the tournament, we were having lunch, and he came down to grab me and said, would you like to meet Tommy Lasorda? And I said, sure. And uh, that was 1984, I guess. 
and Lasorda had won the world championship in 1981 for his first championship. Mm-hmm. And um, we struck up a conversation. And at that time, ironically, I was working at a school called St. Thomas University. Mm-hmm. And after the luncheon ended, he, he and I went behind a wall in the lobby of the Doral Hotel in Miami, Florida, and he spent like four hours with me just talking to me, just he and I. Nobody, nobody saw us. We were just, and it began a relationship that I had with him until the day that he passed. And uh, it was a wonderful 38 years of, of mentoring, of guiding me, of, of teaching me lessons, of giving me experiences that you couldn't pay for. And, uh, you know, when I, when we lost him, it was like losing my father all over Mm -hmm. again. So I looked at that picture and I, you know, the two men that I cherish most in in my life, my father and Tommy Lasorda, you know, that was the day that my dad brought us, brought Lasorda and I together. Yeah. It it, it makes me think of one of the qualities I think of when I think about you is mentorship, because I know me personally finding mentors as I've tried to grow my career and expand my career has been very important to me, but it wasn't, you know, I I talked a little bit about it earlier. I think athletes internalize a lot of what they are taught and coached growing up. And so while I maybe not, don't consciously think about certain things, a lot of that stuff just becomes innate, right? And I think mentorship is one of them. When you're an athlete, you have coaches, they're your mentors, right? They're, they're your, by design, your mentors. And as you get into your career, you, you start to look for those same figures in whatever career you've gone into. And so when I consider your career, there's some very obvious ones. Your father growing up and as the son of a coach, uh, Tommy Lasorda, how, how important, what are, what are the, I know you could talk about this for an hour, but what are the most important things that you learned from those mentors? And if there's ones that I didn't mention that you just have embodied in your career. Cody, uh, obviously growing up, the son of Demi Maneri was a very big thing in South Florida. My dad was the most well-known coach down there. This was before the Miami Dolphins were created and Don Shula came. It was before the University of Miami baseball program established itself. When my dad took over at Miami-Dade Community College, he won the national championship in his fourth year there. And at that time, Miami was kind of a fledging big city. Mm -hmm. And so he was kind of king of the town. And and I was his son, and I loved my dad, and I loved what he was doing. And I spent, I I don't remember conscious life before being in the dugout Mm -hmm. at Miami-Dade in Miami, Florida. So obviously, not not only was my dad a, a, a wonderful father, he was the best man in my wedding, but he was a great mentor for me as I was growing up as a young athlete. Uh, I can still remember him dropping me off for the first day of high school football practice in the ninth grade and and grabbing me by the arm as I was getting out of the car and, and giving me some last words of advice. Um, he just was uh, always there for me, you know. And so he was the he was the coach that I measured all other coaches mm-hmm. against. And unfortunately, you know, you always felt that they all came up short <laughs> against what, what your dad represented. Sure. So when I went away to college, I first came to LSU. And at that time, we had a, a wonderful man as the coach here by the name of Jimmy Smith. But his main job was he was the equipment manager for the football mm-hmm. team. He was literally a part-time baseball coach. And I had grown up in this really intense baseball environment where my dad, you know, was the first junior college coach to win a thousand games and produce 30 future major leaguers and won a national championship and had five second or third place finishes. So, you know, I needed to get into a program where I got, I was going to be pushed and I wanted, cause, because I wanted to find out how good I was. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to go through the rest of my life with any regrets and say, geez, I wonder if I was good enough. If I would have gone into a program that really challenged me, could I have been a major league baseball player? That along with the combination of my heartstrings were kind of tugging on me. I decided to leave LSU after my freshman year and go back and play for my dad. Um, but after I finished playing for my dad, my eligibility was up. So I had to find a new school. Mm -hmm. And this was my last opportunity to find a coach that could be somebody besides my father that could be a a great mentor for me. And by the grace of God, I found Ron Maestri at the University of New Orleans. And Ron Maestri became that person that I had been searching my whole athletic life Hmm. to get to play for outside of my father. And Mace taught me so many things, you know, his intensity was unbelievable, but he also could have fun. Uh, he, he taught me that, you know, coaches are much more than just even coaches of players on the team. You know, they're, 
they need to go out into the community and garner support and get people to like their program. And they might give financial support, they might give emotional support, whatever. I also saw Ron Maestri, you know, do the little things. He would literally drag the field before the game. You know, my dad never had to drag the field before the game. So this was something I, that, I, that caught me by surprise. Hmm. But I realized if you want to be a coach, there's no job that's too small for you to make sure that you develop the, the, the system of excellence that you want to have. And we had great teams the two years I played at UNO for Ron Maestri. And, and he's continued to be a mentor to this day for me. Cody, I probably don't go two weeks without talking to him. And then I mentioned, of course, Tommy Lasorda. You mm-hmm. know, and when I met him, and for those years, so many years, he's been such a great mentor for me. And I think what he brought, what he taught me was that you bring joy to the field, the players will feed off of that. Hmm. You know, if you if you have content players, if you have happy players, you know, they're going to give you everything that they have. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, even though n- nobody likes to lose, and especially me, you know, a loss on a given day, I feel you feel like you're get you know had your heart ripped out. You have to sometimes put on a happy face because you can't let the players get down. Mm-hmm. You know what happened yesterday should not affect today, and the only way that you can control that is by your positive energy that you're bringing to the field. And that's something I learned from my other mentor, Lasorda. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a cardinal rule for baseball, right? Because you, you we joked about it early, but you've, you've won 1,400 games, but you've lost however many. Baseball is a game that's uh, – failure is – like instilled in the core of it. I was I was looking at some of the numbers. I was I was looking at your numbers, the number of wins that you had, and thinking, I wonder if there's any major league coaches that are active right now that have more wins. I think there's like yeah. three. It's um, it's Dusty Baker, it's Terry Francona. There's one more. I can't remember the third one. Okay. But I was looking at the list that got me on a Wikipedia loophole, and I was looking at the list of all time winningest coaches in Major League Baseball. And the list of the first you know top 100 winningest coaches in Major League Baseball, only one had won more than 60% of their games. Yeah. So they lost, all of them had lost right. at least 40% of the games yeah. or more. Mm-hmm. And baseball, to me, is such an interesting lens. I, pl- I played baseball growing up, and I think it's it's maybe the best sport to teach you how to cope with failure and how not to dwell on failure and move on. As somebody that's spent, you know, I've, I played baseball for 12, 15 years, whatever it was. You've been doing this for 60 years mm-hmm. now. What have you learned about moving on from failure, learning from failure, but not dwelling on failure. Well, Cody, and as I think back through all the years that I've coached, we've had, I think, two seasons. I think I had one season at Notre Dame, and I think I've had one season at LSU where we actually only lost single-digit games Mm -hmm. during the course of the regular season. That you remember when we beat Oregon State a couple years ago in the College World Series two times in a row, they went into the game – the first game with a 56 and four record. Yep. I mean, that, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Nobody does that. No. Okay. We two, I think two of the teams I've coached had single digit losses through the regular season. Okay. But most of the time you're going to lose obviously at least 10, maybe between 10 and 20 games during mm-hmm. the year. And you, you potentially can, are going to lose a third of your games. You don't know when they're going to happen. And you can't go into a game and say, oh, today's probably the day we're going to lose one of those <laughs> inevitable games yeah. of 15 games that we're going to lose this year. You have to believe you're going to win every game. So when you don't win that game, the disappointment is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. You've put so much into it, and you want to win so badly. And for whatever reason, the nature of the game, on a given day, you, you came up short. And I'm not a very good loser, I have to be honest with you. You know, if there's ever been a stress in my marriage, it's been on days that we've lost <laughs> games, you know. My my wife has learned through the years that I, I need my space, yeah. you know. And I'm not a very good father and I'm not a very good husband, you know, within the three hours after we lost the, lost the game. Mm-hmm. But after a little while, you, you've, you've got to just fight it and, and put it behind you. And I and like for with our team, I I tell them that we <clears throat> excuse me we have a midnight rule. What does midnight signify? The end of one day and the start of another day. Mm-hmm. And as I tell them, the world rotates on an axis, and when the world rotates every day, the person sitting on top of the world he falls off. Okay, so you could have a great win yesterday, but tomorrow the game starts 0-0 and you've got to do it all over again. 
And conversely, if you had a tough loss yesterday, tomorrow the game starts 0-0 and you have a chance to make up for that loss that you maybe not totally make up for it. But the worst thing you can do is let yesterday's loss cause you to lose today. Yep. And so it's something that I've tried to teach our players that life is this, you know, a baseball season is like the microcosm of life. Life is not a smooth sail on glass like water. You're going to hit potholes along the way. It's not a matter whether you're going to get knocked down. It's how are you going to react when you get knocked down mm-hmm. that's going to determine the success that you have in life, the happiness that you have in life. You're going to have sick children. You're going to not get job opportunities that you thought you're going to have. You're going to have spousal. Uh, relationships that you have to work through sometimes you're going to have problems with your boss at work you're going to have i mean the, you're going to have you know deaths that happen to, in in your family that are going to break your heart there's there's a whole litany of things that you're going to deal with that are real world stuff i think one thing again these kids are so lucky to do is to have an experience of college baseball where they they learn to deal with those mm-hmm. things like I tell the kids, the greatest thing in the world is to win a college baseball game. The second best thing in the world is to lose a college baseball game because at least you were in the arena. Mm-hmm. At least you had the opportunity. And even if you lost, you can learn from that, and that's going to help make you the person that you become. There's a couple of directions I want to take that. I'll, I'll start here. I, I kind of cheated for this interview. I texted one of your former players and uh, and just asked him for, hey, you know, any, any things that I should um, – ask about or just any concepts or or principles that you remember from coach Maneri I'll I'll tell you who after I don't want to rat him out on air but he said one of the things that you talked about um and this is kind of the inverse of that versus dealing with failure he he said that you you put so much pressure on them to be as good as they can possibly be on the field in the classroom and I think I'm paraphrasing I can pull out the text but I'll I'll paraphrase that uh, you tell them to aim for perfection because if you fall short of perfection you, you still reach greatness. And he, he went on to expand that into like, I still use that. I use that in my marriage. I use that in, in everything that I do. And I'm so grateful to coach Maneri for, for instilling that in us. Um, and so I'm curious about that concept of, you know, we just talked about coping with failure, but you know, baseball is a sport where it's almost impossible to be perfect in, in so many ways. And still you push your players, Hey, aim for the very, very highest that you can get because setting that high standard going to set you up for success even if you don't quite reach there well it's flattering to me that to hear that a former player would remember those concepts because you know when you're 18 to 22 years old Cody sometimes you just want to be patted on the back and told how good you are you don't like to sometimes hear, when you're 32 years old too <laughs> it's human nature yeah okay but the thing that is called tough love is that somebody cares enough about you to tell you the truth to push you or to tell you you're doing things that are injurious to yourself. Mm-hmm. If, if, if I was doing something wrong and nobody ever told me, I'd just continue doing something wrong. Is that really somebody caring about me? If you care about me, you're going to tell me the truth. And it's one thing that I've always taken pride in. And I, I, you know, Listen, there's a lot of players that have played for me through the years that probably don't think that highly of me. You know, maybe they didn't get what they wanted out of the experience. Sure. You know, they didn't get enough playing time or whatever. But I don't think any player can ever say that Coach Maneri didn't tell him the truth. And I always tell him the truth because I ask him, do you want the truth? If you want the truth, that means sometimes you're going to hear some things that you don't really want to hear. And I don't mean it in a derogatory, demeaning way. What I mean it uh, for why I'm telling it to you is to help you grow, mm-hmm. to help you get better. And sometimes 18 to 22-year-olds don't understand that when they're with you, but later in life, they understand it. I can't tell you how many letters or phone calls or, you know, literally every day I hear from former players that will share with me something like you just said. And, And it's, you know, it's like why this player called me earlier this week and wanted to talk to me. You know, I, I have no ego, Cody. This is, I'm just happy to to be able to help people, you know, and when, when this player called me or you hear something, it, it flatters me. It makes me feel good because it makes me feel as though maybe I did have some impact on them while they were here. And maybe at times they were angry at me or they thought, you know, that I was being too unreasonable and what I expected out of them or whatever. 
but now they understand the method to my madness, so mm -hmm. to speak, and it's made them a better person. But, you know, um, I know perfection is not attainable. It, it never is. We've talked about that. There's never been a college baseball team go undefeated. There's been some that have come close, <laughs> and those are very unique years, yeah. okay, when that happens. But in the striving for perfection, like I tell the guys all the time, it's not good enough just to practice. You have to practice being perfect. Practice as though you're you're fielding a ground ball with a runner on third base and two outs in the ninth inning. And if you make this play, we're going to Omaha. Mm -hmm. And if you go into your practice days with that level of intensity, the games seem easy mm -hmm. then because you put that pressure on yourself every day. I'll, I'll tell you a, a story that that means a lot to me, okay? When we won the national championship in 2009, of course, I had left Notre Dame three years earlier. And the administrator that oversaw the baseball program when I was at Notre Dame was a guy by the name of Bill Scholl. Bill is now the athletic director at Marquette University and a dear friend. But when I, when I left to come to LSU, Bill left being the administrator of baseball to become the administrator for football. So he had an office over in the Notre Dame football area. Mm -hmm. And we were playing in the national championship game, and he's watching the game from his office. And one of the football coaches from Notre Dame would walk by, and he'd see you had a game on, and he'd say, Bill, what are you watching? Oh, I'm watching Paul Maneri coach in the national championship game. And another coach would be walking by, and he'd notice. And he'd, before you know it, he had a half a dozen Notre Dame football coaches sitting in the office with him watching us beat Texas mm -hmm. for the national championship. So Bill called me a couple days later, and he said, listen, i got to tell you something. He said, one of the coaches that knew you from your time here made a really nice compliment to you, and he said, Paul, uh, uh, Bill, I've been watching Paul's teams for several years, and they always seem to play their best in the big games and the pressure games at the end of the season. How does he get his kids to play with such poise and composure at that time of the year in the, in the most pressure-packed games? And when he asked, so Bill said, you know, when he asked me that question, I said, I don't know, I'll call him and find the answer to that. <laughs> and so when Bill mentioned this story to me, I thought about it for a second. And I said, Bill, that's really quite a compliment. And thank the person for the nice words. But I, I think the best reason I can give to you for, the re, for why the players play poised like that is because I don't hand them anything. If, if 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 that player is out there playing third base or shortstop or second base or first base or anywhere, they had to earn that job. Mm -hmm. I made them earn it, and I didn't make it easy for them to earn it. I made it tough for them to earn it. So by virtue of them knowing that they had to earn that position and had to go through the satis to to earn the satisfaction of Coach Maneri, okay, that instills a great deal of confidence in each individual player out there. He would know he's not out there playing center field for LSU mm -hmm. unless he went through the rigors of trying to win that job. And I think when, when, when players know that about themselves, it gives them a great deal of self-confidence. It gives them a great sense that they belong out there and that they can beat anybody in the country. And consequently, there's no need to panic in the big games yeah. because they know they're good enough. Yeah. I played uh, I played baseball for Leo McClure, who had um, mm -hmm, couple sure. had had a couple uh, of his sons played through here. Uh, Trey McClure played here, baseball. Todd played football. Great baseball coach. I think a lot of what he said was filtered down from <laughs> from Skip Bertman, so we probably spoke a lot of the the Bertman um, languages. But I remember we were playing at the USSA World Series, and we were thirteen or fourteen. I don't remember what. And I was a leadoff hitter, and I was in the slump of my life. Right, I, at zero for twenty, something like that. And I was really down. I mean, I'm a I, one of the challenges I had with baseball is I am a I'm a thinker, and I would you know lose confidence quickly overthink. And I, I'll never forget this conversation. He pulled me over, and it's it's the same thing that you're talking about instilling belief. He said, "You're here because you've earned it, and because I believe in you. And that's not going to change five games, ten games, fifteen games. I know you're going to come through." And that stuck with me to this day. Mm -hmm. When I you know when I'm struggling with work or struggling with my relationship. I just remember the belief that he instilled in me, and I haven't talked to Coach McClure in forever. Mm -hmm. But it, you, you, you keep that that tool of 
instilling self-belief because when you see the other people that have invested you and and believe in you and I'm wondering from your perspective as a baseball coach building off what you said this is a sport where mentally you can I mean it's not like football or or basketball where um where you're going to have success 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 there's going to be times where you go through these these slumps or you get the yips and you can't field a ground ball and so I'm curious how you balance maintaining that pressure on them uh maintaining the the, the high standard, but still instilling that belief and, you know, kind of balancing those two forces. Well, it, that, that's the challenge right there. Uh, I always present it this way by, by asking, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? You know, of course, that's the age-old question, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the, the egg. Well, who, who laid the first egg? Well, a chicken. Well, how did that first chicken exist? Mm-hmm. Well, it came from the egg. You, you know what I'm saying. Yep. So my question is, what comes first, success or confidence? Do you have confidence because you have success or do you need confidence to have success? Yeah. And I know the answer to that question. The answer to that question is you have to have confidence in order to achieve initial success. Mm-hmm. But the more success that you have, the greater your confidence grows in yourself. So how do you get that initial leap where your confidence allows you to have enough success that you earn that confidence of the coach. And I think this is this is one of the things that separates coaches through the years, okay, is your decision on which players you're willing to hitch your wagon to. Yeah, Those are the most important decisions that I can make and every year. Those are the decisions, okay? Stra- game strategy is certainly important, and motivation is important, and, you know, all this, all this stuff is important. But there's nothing more important than selecting the players that you're going to put your belief in, like Coach McClure did with you that Mm -hmm. day, okay? And and I make it hard for players to earn that confidence from me. They, but to hear the word earn, they have to earn that confidence from me. How do they earn it? Because when they're put in a tough situation, they show an inordinate amount of self confidence in themselves. And I say to them all the time. How can you expect me to believe in you if you don't believe in yourself? Mm -hmm. And I can't just instill the confidence in you. You have to have it to start with. But once you prove to me that you can handle the tough situations, because you're going to get your nose bloodied in this game. As you mentioned, this is a game of failure. Mm -hmm. This is the only sport where you can fail 70% of the time and still be considered the best there is. That's a 300 hitter failing 70% of the time, and still be considered the best. So the kids that know how to handle the, the, the short-term failures and not let them turn into long-term failures, I can put it behind them and then be ready to go in that tough situation. Those are the ones that you say, that kid's got something special mm-hmm. about him. And you, and you believe in him. And then you try to take the other kids that aren't quite there yet, and you use those kids as examples mm-hmm. in, in the hopes that it might change the way that, that, that the player that hasn't arrived yet will think and prepare himself mentally. And, you know, fortunately through the years, I've picked the right kids enough times that, that we've been able to have a long career. But that's really the key is to, is to know your own players and to know which of them have the ability but have the confidence in themselves you know, and are dedicated enough and it matters enough to them that they're going to go out and, and, and do it the majority of the time, knowing that there's going to be failure built in. So as, as you were talking, it, it reminded me of one of the other things that uh, your former player texted me. And he said that you always made practices harder than the games. And that was my dad being a coach that was instilled in me growing up. But it's something that I still think about today because I'll be having a rough day. You know, I got two young kids. Maybe I didn't sleep well the night before. Maybe the three-year-old was up in the middle of the night and, you know, I'm, I'm at work and energy's low. And I'll think to myself, man, I remember being at practice at Nichols State in the middle of winter when every other student was at home holding a 45-pound plate over my head, sitting on a wall for two minutes. <laughs> if I could do that, I can do whatever I got to do today, right? Yeah. And so it, when he texted me that, it made me think of that as something that you know, I know that's a principle that you instill with your players, making practice as hard as it can so that they can perform in the pressure situations, but then that carries over into life, right, too. And, and I think that I'm, I'm remembering some research that I did. I'm going to paraphrase a, a quote that you said. You said that you left LSU 
to become the best player that you could be, but then you came back to LSU to test yourself as a coach, That's right? right? I, I didn't say it as eloquently as you. I kind of messed it up there. but um, And so I want to kind of go into that that aspect of it. You seem like someone who has always challenged yourself to to be better, to, to push yourself. And so I'm curious, is that is that something that your dad instilled in you? Is that something that you think comes a little bit both nature and nurture? Where, where did that come from? And then how do you try to implement it with your players? Well, it's a good question about where it originally came from, you know. Uh, Chicken or egg? <laughs> I, no, you know, when I was young, I just, I admired my father so much, you know, and, and my father's teachings stay with, stayed with me for the, will stay with me for the rest of my life. They certainly did during the rest of his life. Um, but one of the things that he used to say to me that I say to my players all the time is that the worst thing that you could have in life is regret. If you regret that you didn't give everything you had to something, then your life will feel unfulfilled. Mm -hmm. If you give everything you had and you, you've, you dedicated yourself and you committed yourself and you had the right attitude and you did the very best that you could. And you know what? It just wasn't good enough to be successful enough to accomplish the goals that you had in your life. You're not a failure. You're a success because mm -hmm. you maxed out your potential. Not everybody's going to play in the major leagues, even though everybody has that goal. But if you did everything you could do to try to make yourself a major leaguer, then you should have no regrets with the rest of your life. And now you can turn that, close that chapter and go on to something else. And so that's, that's what m has motivated me my whole life, hearing that from my dad. And I've tried to pass that on to my players. And, you know, I, listen, when I, when I left St. Thomas University and became the coach at the Air Force Academy, it was the most wonderful experience you could imagine at Air Force. I have four former players that are general officers hmm. in the Air Force. The, these guys are in charge of thirty million dollar budgets, thirty thousand troops. I mean, there are leaders in the country, and they still call me coach. They still call me for advice. That's very flattering. Yeah. Okay, I mean, my my role in those cadets' lives to help them become officers and so forth and leaders of our country I was something I took very serious and I and I, I would have loved to have stayed at the Air Force Academy but when the University of Notre Dame offered me the opportunity hey listen I was a, it was going to be a gamble you know now you're you're leaving some place that you're very secure and you know but you know I enjoyed winning too much you know, and, and it was hard to win games at the Air Force Academy. Mm -hmm. They did the best they could. And, but if we finished 500 every year, that was considered a successful season. And I just wanted to challenge myself and see if we could do better than that. You know, and I went to Notre Dame and, and it, listen, there were a lot of challenges that we had to overcome there, but we, we had success and, and I loved it. And I, and I turned down probably six or seven job oppor opportunities, including a hand, you know, three or four that were in the SEC that nobody ever knew about mm -hmm. to stay at Notre Dame. But when LSU offered me the job, that was when I had to look at myself and say, you know, what kind of a man are you? Mm -hmm. You know, you've been telling your players forever, don't be afraid, go for it, let it rip. If you go down, go down swinging, you know, go with no regrets. And then I kind of looked in the mirror and thought, Maybe I ought to do the same thing that I've been preaching to my players all these years. It was a big risk, a big gamble coming here. I could have stayed at Notre Dame the rest of my career and been perfectly happy, but I needed to challenge myself, Cody, mm -hmm. and I needed, to, like you said, one time, at one point I left LSU to find out how good I was as a player, and I found out how good I was. It was decent enough to play in college and get a chance in pro ball, but I was not a major league baseball player. But I was okay with that once I realized it. Mm -hmm. You know, once I I knew when I challenged myself, I wasn't that kind of player. But I was okay with it, and I knew I was a good coach at Notre Dame. And the Big East Conference was a tough conference, and we were getting a bid every year to the NCAA tournament. We went to Omaha one time. It was the first time Notre Dame had been there in forty-five years. But I also wanted to know, you know, given the resources, the access to players, you know, the whole package that is LSU could we compete at the very highest level of college baseball would I be good enough as a coach to be able to lead a team to a national championship 
And that's why I took the leap of faith at 49 years old, you know, mm -hmm. it, it could have, you know, ruined my career, but I didn't think that way. I just believed in myself and I believed that there was magic in the name LSU. And I believed that we could get the right kids and that we could put together a staff. And listen, we won one national championship. I wish we'd have a couple more in the trophy case by now. We came pretty close one year in 17. Um, we've had probably three or four other teams that were good enough to win. And we just, you know, did didn't get the job done at the time we had the opportunity but it's been a labor of love you know people ask me all the time you know what about the pressure of coaching at LSU and I honestly do not feel the pressure here mm -hmm. because I learned the most valuable lesson I've ever learned from my father when I was a young boy and that was the only person you really have to answer to is the person that you look at every day when you're brushing your teeth the guy that you look at in the mirror if you know you're doing the very best that you can and you're doing things the right way and you're working as hard as you can, you have no regrets. You know, you did the best you could. And I thought if we did the best we could, we would have enough success here that, that I could finish my career at LSU. And hopefully that will be the case. Uh, Coach, I could sit here and pick your brain all day. Uh, it's 1145. I don't want to keep you too much longer. So I'll, I'll end on this. And, and you lead me there with, with that answer. As, as someone who's climb the ranks right and you you get to one point in your career you accomplish a goal and then you set a new one and then you accomplish a goal and then you set a new one H how do you how do you do that in your career especially now to where um you've gotten to to this level and you've won the ultimate prize the national championship so how do you self-evaluate and and i guess i would summarize this question and what does success look like for you in the next 5 10 15 years of your career however long however long you go for <laughs> it's not going to be that long <laughs> <laughs> wishful thinking on my part maybe um, but however long it is what what does success look like for you down the road and how do you define it and set goals and, and reach those goals first of all Cody I, I never took the job at St. Thomas with the hope that it would lead to another job mm -hmm. and I didn't take the job at Air Force thinking it was going to lead to another job it was hard to leave Air Force to go to Notre Dame mm -hmm. It was equally as hard to leave Notre Dame to come to LSU. I told you I turned down a half a dozen other jobs. So I've never taken a, a job with the idea it was going to lead to something else. I just wanted to be a college baseball coach and impact young people's lives. So I'm doing that. I've experienced that. This is now my 39th year of doing it. If, if we never won another game in my career, I think I could walk away and be very proud of what we did accomplish uh, you know, the trophies are awesome. I wish I wish for a couple more of these before yeah. we before, before we call it a career. OK, um, but the, I don't want that to define my impact on young people, mm -hmm. on the people that have been entrusted to me either. I told you before, I don't apologize for wanting to win. I want to win. I want to win the national championship. But more important than that. I, I just want to be there and be the right coach for the kids and and help teach them what it takes to be successful. If we recruit the right kids and we teach them what it takes to be successful and we're demanding and we, you know, all the things that go into it, then I, I think the winning will take care of itself. And if we if we have that magic, magical mix where. It all comes together at the right moment, the right time. We play well at the right time. Then I think we can win the championship again. And that's what I'm striving to do. I know Skip made it seem so easy. It's really not that easy. <laughs> no, it's not. You know? um, so um, I'm going to measure the rest of my career by the way that I will evaluate myself. If, if I'll know when it's time to walk away. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to have to tell me, hey, it's time for you to call it a career. I'll know. I don't think I'm there yet. I think I've got a little bit of time left in me because I still have the passion. I still have the love of what I'm doing. I still think I'm pretty good at what I do. And, um, you know, it, hopefully the players of today, they respect what I'm trying to do with them and they'll, they'll be able to react to it. And I know we have a great coaching staff that is, that, that works with me here. I know we have a phenomenal support staff that works with us here. And I, I, I still think our best days are ahead of us. Yep. So I'm just the optimist and 
you know, I can't say I'm going to measure success by do we win another national championship or two or SEC championship or two. It's a tough league, man. It's a tough league. But we're going to do everything in our power to, to bring in a, that seventh trip, uh, championship trophy back to LSU. And when we don't do it, I'm going to be the most disappointed guy in the world. But I'm not going to be disappointed if we left it all out there on the field and gave it everything we had. And if we came up a little bit short, then that's the way it works. But what I really want to see us do is put so much into it that we're laying exhausted on the field of battle with our – with our arms up, raised victoriously, as Vince Lombardi once said. Yeah, well, Coach, I, I have no doubts you'll get there again. Uh, I'm, I'm confident in that. And, uh, yeah, I, I, thank you for your time. I've got notes here on my computer that I barely even looked at because uh, <laughs> because the conversation was thank so you. good. So we'll have to do it again because i got a million more questions to ask you. Uh, you're, you're an expert on this, and uh, it's been a real treat to just pick your – Pick your brain and, and learn from some of your wisdom. Are you gonna, do I have to wait till we're off camera for you to tell me which player yes. that was? Yes, okay. once the camera's <laughs> off, I'll tell you. <laughs> Thank you, Coach. All right, Cody. Good to be with you.